Já, góðan daginn. Velkomin að málstofu Hafrannsóna stofnunar. Í dag ætlar Júlían Burgos sem hefur starfað sem sérfræðingur á bott sjáar sviði Hafrannsóna stofnunar síðan 2009. Fer með fyrirlestur um um búsvæði á sjávarbotni og hafsvæði Grænlandsunds. Eh rannsóknir Júlíans beinast einkum að djúpsjónum og viðkvæmum vistkerfum í sjó. Megin megin viðfangsefnin eru kortlagning búsvæða, líkanagerð með það markmið að áætla dreifingu tegunda út frá umhverfis eiginleikum og samverkum fisk, veiða og búsvæða. Júlían er með BS skráði í líffræði frá National University of Patagonia í Argentínu. Það hann sem hann kemur og hann fekk síðan MS skráði í sjávarlífræði frá College of Charleston í South Carolina, Bandaríkjunum og svo doktor skráði í fiski og vatnafræðin frá University of Washington í Bandaríkjunum. Já, Júlían, gjörðu svo vel. Takk fyrir. All right, I'm going to talk in English because my Icelandic is horrible. Um, but uh, I will uh, show some uh, very preliminary results of a survey that we did uh, in Denmark Strait this last August. Um, this was a project um, uh, done jointly with the um, Zoological Society of London uh, and the Greenlandic uh, Institute of Natural Resources. And, uh, a cruise was actually funded by the Eurofleet Plus uh, program. So why we um, went to Denmark Strait? Well, Denmark Strait, I guess everybody knows, uh, is the area between uh, Iceland and Greenland, and, uh, and, and I think in Icelandic the name is more appropriate, Grenlandsund. Uh, it has a maximum width of about 300 kilometers. The uh, continental shelves are fairly wide in both Icelandic and Greenlandic sites. And uh, is bisected by the Greenlandic, the Greenland Iceland Ridge uh, that sort of separates uh, the cold waters uh, um, from the north from the more warm uh, water from the North Atlantic. The area has a very complex uh, oceanographic settings you have um, warm and saline waters moving uh, north um, as the um, North Icelandic immigrant, immigrant current. And then you have dense and very cold water uh, moving south, um, forming the, uh, what is known as the Denmark Strait of Overflow. So this generates uh, very strong environmental gradients, among the strongest in the North Atlantic. Uh, with very large differences in, in water mass uh, characteristics, uh, near bottom temperature, current speed, and also the extent of uh, the, sea, um, the sea ice. Um, and uh, this um, variability in environmental uh, conditions is likely to uh, produce a high variability of benthic uh, habitats. Um, but in general, the Benthic habitats in the Strait are not very well uh, known. Uh, the BioIce project uh, sample um, in this area, and there's also data from bycatch from bottom trout surveys, both in Iceland and in Greenland, uh, and also in the Icelandic side, the, um, the marine habitat mapping program uh, that Havro does. Uh, we have done uh, our, uh, underwater video uh, transects, but uh, only down to 600 meters. The Greenlandic side and the deeper part of the, of the um, strait has not been uh, filmed before. So, um, but all this uh, preliminary information so like, uh, suggests or, or, or is evidence that there is actually a lot of, of um, of diversity, diversity in environments, 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 and also there's also, also the presence, the, the possible presence of, of, of vulnerable marine ecosystems. So um, we um, joined forces with uh, the Greenland Institute of Natural Resources and the uh, Zoological Society of London and wrote a proposal uh, to the Eurofleet program 
And we were lucky, uh, it got uh, funded, and we uh, were allowed to use the um, GeoSARS, this uh, Norwegian research vessel. Uh, we had it for 10 days uh, this, last, this last summer. So the objective of the, of the cruise was basically to obtain information, basically information on the distribution and composition of the uh, ecosystems on the seabed, in particular focusing on VMEs, on vermal marine ecosystems. Um, for this area, we have done prediction of, of distribution models um, uh, through the Nova Sark project. So we, went, we wanted to validate this model because the models were fitted using data from other areas. There's actually very little data uh, for Denmark Strait. Um, we wanted to get actually um, new data basically to, to uh, fit newer, uh, high resolution models for this area. Uh, and then the other big uh, objective was to describe the uh, properties, the uh, hydrographic properties of the uh, Denmark Strait and measure currents and, and contribute to the understanding, understanding of the oceanographic, oceanographic settings. And, settings and, and so basically to try to understand better how the oceanography drives, drives the distribution of the benthic environments. environments. And then uh, finally to collect uh, bathymetry and scatter uh, in, some, in some areas. So this is the um, survey track. Uh, is, um, the original design was um, three transects, one on the uh, Greenland Iceland Ridge, and then north and, an, and another south. But then we uh, modified a little bit, so it ended up looking like this. Um, uh, so we have a nice uh, distribution of stations in, in different environmental settings both in the Icelandic and the Greenlandic sites. Um, and we were very lucky because we have the most perfect weather that you can think about in, in a survey. We have, we planned for about 20 ROV dives. And we managed to do 28. From those three, we were not allowed to get into the bottom because the current was too strong. So we have actually 25 successful dives. So we want to thank Egir for his um, yeah, contribution to this, uh, to the weather that actually was, it was so good that the only problem that we had is that we have fog and uh, at, some, at some point we have to uh, deal with icebergs because um, there was basically no wind. It was completely flat for 10 days. So it was really, really good. Um, so first, a little bit about the multi-beam and bus cutter uh, data. This is the data that we had before the cruise. Uh, it was it's, uh, some areas in the Icelandic uh, EZ and nothing in the Greenlandic side. Uh, there's actually a little bit of data missing on the south, but that's basically the, um, the, the picture before the survey. So this means that we um, had to collect uh, small boxes of multi-beam data in the location that we were planning on, on do the ROV dives. And this is, so we collected between 10 and 20 square kilometers of multi-beam. Uh, and this was basically to provide uh, data for the navigation of the ROV and also to, uh, to give some context to the observations that, um, that we see during the, during the dives. Um, about the physical oceanography, uh, we have a, a number of um, uh, sampling uh, devices uh, during the cruise. Uh, first, we were using an acoustic Doppler current profiler uh, to measure uh, the current speeds down to 600 meter. And this is the distribution of the currents at the depth of 300 meters. And there's a couple of things that you can see clearly. The, uh, in the south, you can see the Irmega current uh, moving northwest. Um, you can see in the center, maybe I can actually, yes, I'll use the arrow. Yeah, so around here, um, in the center, you can see the very strong um, movement of the overflow. overflow. Uh, uh, and then, then in this area, the area East the Iceland current, current uh, moving uh, west. west. We have uh, um, continuous measurements of temperature and salinity and fluorescence uh, on surface during the survey. Uh, and, um, and you can see the maps of uh, temperature to the left and salinity 
uh, to the right, the, the very um, you know, strong difference in temperature, uh, and also you can see the very um, layer of uh, fresh water um, on, the, on the map on the right. In addition, we conducted 27 CTDs, um, and uh, in, four, in 24 of those, we took water for measure uh, dissolving granulated carbon and alkalinity. This is uh, the temperature and the salinity in the southern section. And you can see, um, yeah, the, uh, for example, here, the, the uh, Denmark overflow is, is very visible on the um, slope of the Denmark, um, the Greenlandic shelf. In the shelf. Um, there's uh, Arctic conditions on the westernmost part of the, of the section. And then you can see, yeah, pretty much uh, warm and saline waters of the Atlantic uh, immigrant current in the upper 500 meters. In the central section, uh, it's pretty much dominated by uh, overflow waters, cold water between zero and two degrees. Um, and then on the top layer, uh, um, yeah, extremely fresh uh, melt water. And uh, basically, it's so only warm and saline water on the Icelandic side. And finally, the northern section is um, basically a very little uh, of warm and saline Atlantic water uh, on the core, one core on the Icelandic side, and then it's mostly dominated by cold waters of the Iceland um, uh, current. So in terms of benthic habitat, we have the... Um, the reason that we choose this ship, or we ask to see, is because it provides an opportunity to use the Aegir 6000 ROV, and that's perhaps the name of the ROV that we have, the good weather that we get. Um, uh, the Aegir has uh, the possibility to obtain samples uh, using a, a manipulator, and this is an example. Here we are getting a soft coral, and, um, and it has a, the, the, well, the, the, the technicians were highly skilled and we ha had the capacity of um, collecting small, fairly small objects from the, from the seabed. Uh, the samples are put in kind of a drawer that the ROV has on the front. And then it also has um, a suction sampler that is basically a, like a vacuum cleaner that you can actually collect objects that are uh, very small, too small for the manipulator, or objects that are um, sort of brittle. For example, sponges that if you grab them with a manipulator, they'll break, so you can use the suction sample for that. And there's a... Um, but it goes into the hose. There's a series of containers in the back of the ROV that um, the sample cell are stored there. Okay, there it goes. Yeah, so basically like cleaning your home. Yeah. <laughs> then when the, R the ROV comes back to the ship after the, um, the, uh, the dive, Basically, the samples collected um, are collected and then are taken to the lab where they are weighed and measured and photographed and then a series of samples are taken for different purposes like uh, DNA for uh, genetic testing and um, speckle for identification of species in, in the case of sponges and so forth. So um, we were uh, lucky because uh, we, da we don't have in Iceland the capacity to do this kind of samples. So, um, um, so it was a very good opportunity to be able to do this. So I will show you now what I we're going to do is basically do a little show and tell about some of the habitat that we saw. Uh, and um, the other nice thing about the Egir is that it has very good video cameras. It has basically, it carries a 4K video camera and also a high definition camera that is um, 
The high definition camera is used during the entire um, during the entire a dive, and then the 4K camera is used for interesting bits uh, because basically the files are much bigger. Uh, here we see uh, on the here we are on the top of the Mardol Seamount. This is on the south um, transect, and uh, an area that. It's characterized by uh, deep sea sponge aggregations, what people call Ostur habitat. And this is at depth between 970 and 1230 uh, meters. And it's a habitat dominated by species uh, like Geodea, Craniella, and Peronema. And um, during the um, autumn, Ground fish survey, we have uh, obtained a very large sponge bycatch in the trolls done in this area. So we have uh, uh, proposed a new special closure um, to the Ministry of Fisheries because this, uh, we consider this is area where there's a, a vulnerable marine ecosystem, the, the high density sponge aggregations. So hopefully it will be put into, into place. Then uh, we also visited one of these uh, cone-shaped seamounts um, that are much more smaller, and there are several of those in the, in the southern basin of the Denmark Strait. And here we saw a much harder uh, seabed. And um, what you see on the video is um, uh, Sclerotinia coral, uh, Sol Solenosmilia. Uh, and then uh, the red one, the red coral is, is uh, Antomastus. And these are species that are more typical of, of, um, of hard bottoms. And, um, and the other nice thing about the ROV, of course, is the capacity to navigate in, in sort of like complex bottoms and uh, with very high precision. So with a system that we use regularly for our own surveys, we have to be careful in places like this because we can we use a tow uh, camera system that uh, we can crash it uh, if the bottom is very irregular and we are too close to the bottom. But the ROV, basically, you can just um, drive it like a car and just it will uh, stand next to any feature and allow you to film uh, and get um, data and imagery with um, very high quality. So it was, yeah, it was actually really nice. In the Greenlandic side, uh, this on the south uh, side uh, on shelf, we saw uh, some areas with very high densities of uh, sea anemones, which in some cases are also considered VMEs, and also um, cauliflower corals. And uh, this kind of habitat is the only place that we saw it. I need to get David Attenborough to, to narrate these videos. Um, in the Green Lake uh, shelf, we also saw uh, some umbellula. Uh, these are very large sea pens. They can be up to two meter high. Um, they live in, in soft bottoms um, in relatively cold waters. So we also saw them in, in the northern basin. And, uh, and they are uh, basically when you touch them, they are fluorescent. So we did an experiment and tried to touch them with the manipulator of the ROV to see if we can detect the fluorescence with the cameras, but it was, it didn't work. But this, these are amazing animals and, and um, also consider a, a, a VME indicator species when you have them in high numbers. A very particular, uh, a very interesting habitat is what we saw on the slope of the West Fjords, where, oops, um, where we have this um, cauliflower coral field. These are areas with very high density and, and very high diversity of soft corals um, and also sponges. And this type of habitat, we have seen it before 
in other dives that we did in 2017 uh, in uh, areas nearby. So with these dives, uh, we sort of like um, got a better idea of the extent of the habitat. Um, the diversity in these areas is, is very, very high and, and um, um, So um, it was a, an actually a mesmerizing experience to be watching this. Uh, uh, I guess we are all biologists, uh, so we get very excited when we see these kind of things. But every time that the ROV was on the bottom and the images and the uh, video was coming, we were all glued to the monitors watching um, what was uh, on the seabed. And these type of habitats in particular were, um, were particularly interesting. We also saw um, seepen fields. These are areas where there are very high densities of seepens. Uh, seepens are fairly common in, in, in areas with soft bottoms, but when you have high densities, then these are considered uh, boron marine ecosystems. And, um, and this is uh, basically one uh, very interesting aspect of the dives in this area is the patchiness in some areas, in some the patchiness of the habitats, because we will see high density of um, of seepens for a while, and then suddenly, because the bottom was a little bit uh, harder, then we see we switch to a different um, community of the much more dominated by sponges. So it was really, really striking. As soon as you leave the sort of like bit of hard bottom and you're back in the soft bottom, then the, the sipens are back. So these are among the highest uh, sipen densities that we, we've seen so far. So here we are also proposing uh, another closure based on the data that we collected in 2017 and uh, the data that we got uh, this summer. Uh, this area is important to, to protect because, as I say, the diversity uh, of, of seabed um, organisms is very, very high, and at the same time, it's an area that is very close to uh, areas where the, there's a very heavy fishing um, uh, activity. Uh, in this map, you can actually see the, the troll from, uh, from derived from VMS data. And so, like, a, a, and there's also, there's increasing fishing effort on the north, uh, on this area, in the area that is called the, the potato garden. Um, so it's important to, uh, to protect this habitat. Um, and um, in case, uh, yeah, the, the fishing effort starts to move into deeper waters. Um, on the north transect, we have conditions of very cold water, uh, but still on the Greenlandic shelf in particular, uh, there was a high diversity of sponges. And these are um, sponges were the main um, taxa in this in these habitats, or the main habitat forming uh, forming taxa. And it was while I was pre preparing these videos, it was really hard actually to decide what to show and not, not have a talk of you know, four hours because we have very, very good material and everything was, was um, yeah, very exciting. So if you want to see more, you know where to find us and we'll be happy to, to show you more uh, material from you. Um, on the deep northern basin, here the seabed is a uh, very soft bottom. Um, one of the in interesting species that we saw are these uh, Crondocladia sponges. These are carnivorous sponges that have this sort of like globular uh, structure to capture prey. Um, 
somebody in our cruise called them the ping pong uh, sponges. And um, these are really, really amazing creatures. Um, the, um, the temperature in here is basically zero degrees and uh, and the density, obviously, of, of organisms was much lower, but still, uh, there's a lot of life. And in and, and some location where you have a little bit of um, hard bottom, like when you have drop stones from, from glaciers, then you, you will see aggregation, small aggregations of sponges growing in, in those places. Presentation is not behaving. I was a little bit worried that because of all the heavy videos, I was going to have a little bit of trouble. Okay. Uh, so we barely are starting uh, to analyze the data from this uh, survey. Um, the first step is to annotate the videos and photograph. This means that we uh, will have to basically go through all the videos and all the photographs and identify all the organisms to the lowest taxonomic level possible, and then uh, obtain estimations of, of abundance and density. Then once we have that, which is sort of like the basic data that we need to get from the, from the videos and photographs, and, and this is a very time consuming effort, um, we're gonna do statistical analysis to identify biotopes or communities, so basically which species tend to occur together and then we um, will explore how those biotopes are associated to env the environmental parameters that we measure, um, like the hydrography and also the, the, um, the seabed type that we see from the videos. And then with this, we will uh, yeah, develop this uh, predictive distribution model that I was uh, talking to. And then we also will do some um, model validation of the existing models that we did before to see uh, how well they are predicting the distribution of BME in, in Denmark Strait. And finally, uh, just to say that this uh, cruise was amazing, uh, basically because we had an amazing group of people um, from several countries, from Iceland, uh, the UK, Greenland, and Norway, and um, they have a very high level of professionalism and um, and then managed to, um, yeah, we managed to do everything that we wanted to do uh, and everything went smoothly. And that is just because the quality of the people that were there. So, yeah, so that's everything for me. Thank you, Julian. Uh, there are quite a lot of people on watching you on online on YouTube. And if someone there has questions, they can post them in the chat. Are so there any questions in the room? So this means that I am an influencer. Yes. <laughs> Are there any questions? I have one question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the next steps, I didn't see a new survey. Is that, is that some, somewhere close in the future, a new survey? Well, uh, there's two things that we're thinking. Um, as part of, the, of the, our habitat, regular habitat mapping program, uh, we hope that we will go back to this area because there are areas that we have not seen. Uh, and then we are actually considering the possibility of preparing a new Eurofix proposal, but uh, this time to explore the Iceland Far Off Ridge. So, it's a, so like a, we're gonna try to do something similar, but to a different area. So. I guess I was going to point out that area, please. Yeah. I would, <laughs> no, nice area there as well. Um, yeah, and then the, the good thing about it is that we uh, this summer we got the, uh, we multi beam most of it. So yeah, yeah. So that we have the the multi beam data already.
and and and, uh, and our new vessel will will that help you or, or do we still need cooperation like like this uh, well th this is a this was almost like a special treat uh, the advantage that we have the main advantage is that we have the capacity to sample so we will not get that with a new vessel uh, because we will not get uh, an ROV, a large ROV with, a, with that capacity. Um, but uh, yeah, but we, we, we will be able to do our mappings uh, using our cameras with a new vessel for sure and, and probably in a better way than we can do it with the, with the, the old Bjarne. So. Any questions anywhere? Any questions? Yep, I can. How, how much does it cost, IR 3000? Cost? Like to buy? Mm -hmm. Oh my god, I have an idea. Uh, yeah. You know, I, so, yeah, I don't know. Probably a lot of money. Um, okay. Okay, Julia, we have one question online mm -hmm. from Oddny Magnusson. Okay. Is it feasible to estimate the coral biomass or coral coverage in the area? Um, biomass is tricky. Uh, coverage, yes, because um, um, because uh, yeah, because then the coverage is basically is, is, um, something that you measure from the from the images. Um, but the estimation of biomass is more difficult because you, you need to have that conversion rate between uh, yeah, coverage and how much biomass you have in a square meter of, of coral, and we don't have that. So that's, that's a limitation. For many of the analyses that people are doing now, for, uh, for example, for uh, looking at the impact of fishing activities on the seabed, are based on biomass estimations of the, of the different um, uh, yeah, different taxa and how the biomass of different organisms change with fishing effort, and we cannot do that in this, in this habitat. So. Thank you. I, I hope that answered the question, Odni, but you just comment if, if not. Uh, we were chatting a little bit before you started. You have a lot of very interesting videos and, and figures, and I, I personally believe that this is something that the general public uh, would love to see is do you plan on you know ha have a art show or something yes we are planning on that we have not nothing specific yet but the, the yeah the quality of the videos that we got is so good that we want to have some kind of um, show so people can see it and um, so we're gonna work with the with the uh, people at Hafro that are um, yeah, in charge in charge of um, outreach to prepare something. So, yeah, that's on the on the list of things to do. Okay, uh, Altney sends his greetings from the Coral Sea. He's yeah, he's happy with your answer. Uh, I think this is it. Thank you, Julian. All right. Thank you and so much. Thank you for watching. Bye. Bye. Bye.